So shut up. I'm going to start the show. Oh, it's not like it's Christy. <laughs> Didn't it look like that? <laughs> shut up. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to episode 77 of One Million of the Serial Chillers podcast from the Super Network Studio. I am here with Hella Greg in his regular bunker across the internet. Regular bunker? Yeah, the mobile bunker ran out of fuel. <laughs> you could tell I read, I just Ron burgundy that. I was like, what the fuck? I don't think I wrote regular. <laughs> I saw that and I went in there and I added that. I changed, I changed some stuff around. All right, see. well. <laughs> I'm Ron Guess Burgundy. Else the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look what happens when you actually send me the outline. Yeah, exactly. That's why I don't. Uh, well, <laughs> that leads to my first move. question of the night. How goes it, Alla Greg? Feeling mischievous. I can tell. I can tell. It's going to be a fun night, I think. It uh, feels like it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, don't forget to follow the show everywhere, you guys. Facebook, Serial Chillers Podcast. Facebook group is the same. The Instagram is the same. The Twitter is at Chillers Podcast. Email us, Serial Chillers Podcast at gmail.com. Call or text us, 1 805 666 2513. for merch. Rate and review us on everything. Please, patreon.com slash Serial Chillers Podcast. If you'd like to give as little as a dollar a month to get some extra cool shit and support your boys. That's us. Support us. Yes. Uh, your boys. We're your boys. <laughs> We're your boys. Uh, two returning guests. Two dudes I think you guys like a lot. I would like to welcome back, as a as a tandem, welcome back, Joseph and Alex. I thought Alex was going to say <laughs> something. <laughs> I, I was looking at Joseph. Hey, guys. We were, we were supposed to go now. We're back. We uh, we were invited back. Um, I didn't think we were going to be. Uh, <laughs> I think this is what, our, our sixth or seventh episode? Six? Your seventh, my sixth, I think. Or my fifth. You guys have been on all yeah. the... Yeah, dang. So. It's been been quite quite a good time yeah Season these guys were on the second episode that doesn't exist anymore it's gone but they've been one. they've been through it with us for sure <laughs> yes uh, as we approach 1 million episodes yep. only 998,923 uh, to go yep we'll be on we that episode been right up on it yep <laughs> all right well welcome dudes good to have you you guys know how the show works let me explain it for anybody that doesn't each week i sit down with old friends new friends good friends and bad friends to tell them the story of an infamous serial killer throughout the show you guys can chime in on my story and if you brought a story of your own that is true crime dark creepy unsolved or otherwise mysterious please feel free to share it Lastly, if you have questions about the questions, make sure to ask questions because I cannot answer questions about questions if you never ask questions. Are there any questions? Then welcome to and let's play the Serial Chillers podcast. Today's serial killer. Tell me, have you guys heard of Jesse Harding Pomeroy? No idea who that is. Not the slightest clue. Dang. Well, then. I never know him, man. <laughs> question number one. Okay. In what year was Jesse Pomeroy born? Closest to the answer gets 250 points, 1,000 if you nail it. We're doing uh, exact dates now because you get 2,000 points if you somehow nail Dang. the exact day they were born. Give me an exact date. What's, oh, what's like his... right? I was hoping you meant year when you said date. Yeah, I thought so, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, that's originally what it was. But give me a day, month, and a, and a year now. Um, what's his name again? Jesse Harding Pomeroy. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that's when I was born. <laughs> Is this your birthday? It's my literally my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to. I'd like to act like I knew that from heart. But uh, Alex says. <laughs> Is this your birth year? That's my. That's the day I was born. Oh <laughs> my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph said was it December 4th, 1948. 19, yeah. Joseph's going to get 250 points because Jesse Harding Pomeroy was born November 29th, 1859. Oh. Do I get any points for guessing your birthday? No. Yeah. I feel like it was deep down in your brain subconsciously, though. So I, I'm not I will tell lie. you, I love you. Thank you. I love you too. I'm not going to lie. I 
the the state chose me. I didn't I didn't choose it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's like that's weird. what I I, that's I felt that weird. when I looked over, I was like, he okay, he that's super doing. weird, guys. Yeah. You get one point. All right, so he's born November 29th, 1859, <laughs> 250 points to Joseph. Uh, we have 14 questions tonight, guys. They come, come kind of rapid fire because the show is a little different tonight. Uh, Jesse Pomeroy, long time ago. Not, there is a lot of information, I will be honest. Uh, the books about him are from the early 1900s, and they are boring as fuck. So it was very hard to get uh, a lot of detail, and most of them were just really about uh, their disposition and position towards what had happened to him later in life. So his story isn't that well covered. So that's, that's where I'm at with it. It's a little bit short, but I have another great kind of almost my own side story. Joseph brought a story and Greg, did you? That's a negative ghost writer. 10, four. So, um, Jesse Pomeroy is born to Thomas and Ruth Ann Pomeroy in Charlestown, Massachusetts. Uh, they were, he was born in like pretty slummy area. I'm, I'm not saying that all of Charlestown was, it may have been, but he was born in some pretty, um, in a pretty rough neighborhood. He was the second of two children and his father, Thomas was a veteran of the fucking civil war. So, you know, uh, Sick. pretty metal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like if you lived through the civil war, yeah, like, like Greg that, said, that's it's that was metal. like a good war, <laughs> like that one and the Revolutionary War. He was a like a sickly child. It's the 1850s, I think. That was, I it's won't a, say it's common, a given. But it's a given. Yeah, yeah, it was it was happening. Um, he had some type of issue where like his body was like in very weird proportions. Apparently, he had like a very long torso and a really big head, and his arms were like kind of short for everything. I think, you know, he wasn't, it didn't impede his movement. Like, you know, he was, he just was like, he looked disproportionate and weird. And he also had a very, um, prominent cleft lip. Ooh, King Phoenix. So yeah, yeah. He's, he's got a, um, he's got a lot going on. So, um, In 1864, he is five years old now, pets begin to disappear from his own home and neighboring homes. Uh, At the age of five, he is caught torturing the neighbor's cat. Question number two. In what way did this five-year-old torture a cat? Did he A, stab it and toss it in a river? B, beat and throw it down a well? C, stuff it in a sack and toss it in with horses to trample? D, break its neck and leave it on their porch. Stab it and toss it in a river. Beat it and throw it down a well. Stuff it in a sack and toss it in the the horses to be trampled. Or break its neck and leave it on the porch. All right. Both of you guys say that he beat it and threw it down a well. But both of you guys are not scoring points on this one. Was it C? It was C. I feel like it was D. It was A. (laughs) (laughs) Literally everything. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah. So apparently, uh, the neighbor heard like the cat. You know, cats when they're truly struggling, it's not like a meow anymore. It's a very uh, distressed yeah. sound. So the neighbor comes out and sees five year old Jesse with a knife stab the cat, and they lived like just beyond a river. So he stabs the cat and like drags it down and throws it into the water. Dang. And the neighbor's like, uh, like you know, he wasn't close enough to even catch him doing it but he definitely uh, had a very good shot at the five-year-old stabbing and uh, tossing his uh, cat into the river so yeah good times five years old uh the neighbor obviously couldn't believe what they had just seen a few years later 1869 he is now 10 um jesse's behavior is not really getting any better from what i understand there's not a lot of animal killings that they know about him between now and then but he's kind of just uh constantly acting out and his father's slightly abusive up to this point, but at, when Jesse turns ten, um, he gets he gets his first like real real beating, and his dad's not going to stop doing it once he starts. Question number I misnumbered him. See, there's probably thirteen tonight. Uh, question number this one: uh, <laughs> With what did he beat his son for this first real beating? Was it a his fists? B a fire poker? C, a horse whip, or D, a wood switch. When you say a horse whip, you talking like a riding crop? Or like a uh, oh, like, like a like a big Indiana like Jones the, style like the, whip? The training whip. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Like Damn, horse. so he could get you from like 
a ways away. Yeah. I'm guessing Get you at like 10, one. 15 feet, just snap right in the eye. Greg Fuck likes you. the range of C. So Greg's Greg's leaning you guys towards C. Are you guys going to trust Greg's gut? Can you? Don't fucking listen to me. Can you, <laughs> can you say him again? That's, that's a bad it's, investment. It's fists, fire poker, horse whip, or wood switch. Like it's switch, you know? Yep. Go tear switch. This sounds pretty 1800s. All right. Both you guys guess B again. Double fire pokers. Double zero. Sorry, oh fellas. God. Should have gone with Greg's gut because his father would have Jesse Pomeroy stripped down completely naked and be beaten with the whip. Oh, damn it. This is the second time he brought up horses, mm-hmm. too. And from what I understand, he didn't really he didn't whip him. He took the whip in full and he kind of flogged him on the back with the leather and yeah yeah so uh not either not a, yeah not a, pretty, not a pleasant not a pretty, or pretty uh, yeah exactly picture. no though you got to be pretty good to be whipping on a back like that anyway i think what do you suppose like he told the kid you suppose, like you know back in my day we got beat with bricks like <laughs> you're lucky this is nice leather right here this is genuine this hurts me more than it hurts you <laughs> No, nah, I think back then they were honest with their children. This hurts you more than it's going to hurt me. My hand's going to sting for a little bit, but you're not going to be able to sit down for like an hour. I will sleep well tonight. Your ear's not going to stop ringing until you're 19. <laughs> so, <laughs> shitty knees and a bad attitude, man. Uh, so, he, he's, he gets his ass kicked with this whip, and a few too many times. Um, due to... Uh, Pretty much his weird behavior is just going to continue um, until eventually his father is gone. Not yet, though. Uh, he's at school and bullied and tormented for the way he looked and acted. Apparently, he was just a loner that liked to read. He looked fucking weird. Uh, in 1860s, this is like when you just move away and join a freak show when you look kind of weird. Mm-hmm. Like, le- legitimately, like that was the life you had to lead. <laughs> um, he was... Uh, he didn't have the best situation. No one, no one that's on the show does initially. Yeah, uh, some of them do, I suppose, but for the most part, no. Question number four: Besides his cleft <clears throat> lip and disproportionate features, what was one very significant feature that Jesse had? Is it a four fingers on one hand? B four toes on one foot? C a large scar across his face? Or D a milky white eyeball. Um, I hope it's all of them. I've never seen Alex answer one with such confidence. It makes me feel like this just jarred the story in his mind. I've I've never heard I've uh, never heard yeah. this one. Yeah, uh, Joseph. Says four fingers on one hand. Ooh. Alex says a milky white eyeball. Ooh. And Alex is very correct. That is a very distinct feature of today's killer. One of his eyeballs, for whatever reason, uh, was Fetty Wap. Milky and it, they it said they white. described it as like a milky white eyeball or uh, milky <laughs> white marble. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so his milky white yeah. eyeball was his, milky. White. It was his like milky eyeball, white, white marble <laughs> is how they described it. And uh, you could see the the pupil and the cornea, but it, it didn't react to anything, and it was yeah. through like a milky film essentially. Yeah. So, so he's like so a it lizard. didn't work. No, 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 it was not, uh, not a function. Not a function. Not, not operable. Not okay. a good hand. No, no, no. He was not. like that tiger up there. Yeah, yeah. He's got blood shooting out of his apple. <laughs> he's like that guy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he's had a terrible life so far. Um, he's going to start early into some very scary shit, in my opinion. So, with his creepy white eyeball and disproportionate body, on December 26th, 1871, at 12 years old, he's going to torture a boy named William Payne, or Billy Payne. Jesse forced the kid uh, to get naked and tied him up and then beat him with a rope, much like the whip floggings that his uh, father had given him. Uh, Jesse, after he was done beating the boy, released him, and Billy was not able to identify him due to how traumatic it was and the fact that Billy was only seven years old. So, so I I have totally heard this story. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> like that right there undid some traumatic shit for me where I tried to repress this whole thing. This story? Yeah. Like, I know about this dude. I, and, yeah. And how old is he at this point? 12. He's 12. And this was a seven-year-old that he attacked. Gotcha. Wow. The day after Christmas? So that's December 26th, correct. Uh, he just he beat him with a rope, like badly from what I understand. February 22nd, about two months later, 1872, uh, he's still 12, just, um, oh, sorry, yeah, he's still 12. Uh, he's going to lead a young man named Tracy Hayden to the same place where he took Billy Payne and do the exact same thing, also releasing Tracy. Um, and Tracy is also not able to identify him. Tracy Hayden was nine years old at the time and was promised money for help with an errand. So Jesse told him, hey, like, I just need help. I'll give you, you know, whatever, 10 cents if you help me out with this thing. And he took this kid out and tied him up and took all his clothes off and beat the shit out of him. He's lopsided and wide eye. Why is it hard to recognize this kid? I feel like that's I think they're like seven and nine year olds, yeah. like experiencing some like incredibly but traumatic shit. When I was seven, if someone's offering me money, I look at their eyes because I'm a little kid, and that's what well, that's different, you know? Yeah, yeah. I don't know, man. I don't know. He, he beat the memories from them, I suppose. Maybe they're trying. <clears throat> maybe they're trying to be all politically correct and like not say anything about it, and they're just like, no, there was I nothing different or outstanding about him. <laughs> He's he's the same as everybody else. <laughs> Seemed like a very normal individual. May 20th, 1872, a few months later, he's going to beat and torture Robert Meyer in the same place. Uh, he promised this young boy a trip to the circus. Question number five. What changed about the encounter this time? Was it A, Jesse would kill this boy? B, he achieved sexual climax from it? C, he was able to be identified this time, or D, the boy escaped before it got too bad. How old was he at this one? He's still 12. This is like five months after the first attack. Hmm. Six months. Uh, that one. Did okay. he kill him, achieve sexual climax, able to be identified, or have his victim escape? Joseph says he was able to be identified this time because that milky white eye, you just can't get away from it. Alex said that he achieved sexual climax for the first time. Alex is going to take the lead for the first time tonight because, yes, this is the first time that Jesse Pomeroy will achieve sexual climax from essentially just uh, causing somebody else some pain. Um. Okay, so uh, he's going to start achieving sexual climax for all of his crimes from, from now on. on. Yeah, yeah, you know, the classic escalation. I and it's he um, wasn't this kind of guy. Yeah, he's this kind of guy. Uh, Jesse would later admit that he believed that he could reach climax when people were suffering their, at their most. So, like, that was what got him. Like, he needed... Yeah. I want to go on record saying that's a suck ass superpower. Yeah. <laughs> so, July 20th, 1872, Jesse's mother throws his dad out of the house. He may have also left on his own fruition. There are conflicting accounts. I should just mention that, you know, uh, his dad is gone at this point. It's quite obvious um, that his dad was a, a huge piece of shit and an alcoholic, and he was beating his mom, and he was beating him, him and he was beating his older brother. Um, some think that his mom threw him out to help, uh, protect her children, especially Jesse, as he was the one getting it the worst ups and downs of the story. Who knows? It was fucking 140 years ago. Yeah. But it's still the same story. She dumped him. Nuh-uh. It was mutual. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's not, that's not incorrect. So... Um, July 22nd, two days later, Jesse, probably reeling from the separation of his parents, um, two days later, fucking two days later, uh, you would think that, uh, he'd be relieved that his father is gone, but question number six, he's going to, uh, lure a young boy into a odd place to assault him. What odd place? Is it A, a horse barn? B, a library, C, an outhouse, or D, a church. Notice I no longer say library or tamari. 
Um, can you say them one more time? Yes. Uh, horse barn, library, outhouse, church. Uh, Alex says, in a church, the Lord would not approve. Joseph said, in a barn. Isn't Hold on. Isn't that the Lord's kind of whole game? <laughs> <laughs> like, can't die in a church. Wait. Wait. Uh, yeah, no points for anybody. Sorry, dudes. There's an outhouse. I knew it. He lured him to an outhouse. Son of a beast. Yeah, you gotta go with your gun. Yeah, he George Michaeled him. Yeah, (laughs) Jesus. So he lured a young boy to an outhouse by offering him money for help with a job. He then beat and tortured seven-year-old Johnny Balch until he achieved orgasm once more. He then threatened his life if he ever told anybody about what just happened. The problem is that he is not ever really able to be identified by any of the fucking victims yet because they're incredibly traumatized by the situation. I've never been through a situation like that. So, I mean, I we, we all feel like we'd see that stupid fucking milky eye. But I, I don't know. I don't think there's any way. No that offense can, to anybody who has a milky eye. Yeah, yeah. It would just be identifying. Uh, on August 2nd, 1872, his family... Producer Greg right there. <laughs> on August Shaboy. on August 2nd, 1872, um, his family moves from Chelsea to South Boston. There's a few reasons that this may have been, but the main reason people believe is due to the father's departure. Some speculate that this is because the coverage in the newspaper about the torturer and his mother uh, realized, uh, his mom realized like, oh shit, the, this guy doing this is, is Jesse. So uh, the newspaper gives him a nickname at this time. What is that nickname? Is it A, Torture Man, B, the Boston Boy Fiend, C, the Ghost in the Night, or D, the Boston Boy Pervert? Torture Man, Boston Boy Fiend, Ghost (laughs) in the Night, Boston Boy Pervert. Okay, Alex says, Torture Man. Joseph <laughs> says, The Boston Boy Fiend. A very superhero name. Torture I'm man. Torture Man. <laughs> uh, Joseph, 250 points to man. knot this thing up. Yes, he man. is the Boston Boy Fiend. I really wanted to pick D, but A really made me laugh. It did. That's why I knew it wasn't Oh, it. man. No one's calling anyone Torture Man. <laughs> That's like Bible Man. <laughs> and so, uh, again, I remember Bible shitty Man. Super, again, shitty superpower. Yep. Bible Occurring man. theme tonight. Keep listening. You'll find some more. <laughs> so uh, when they move to South Boston, his mom immediately rents a storefront and opens a dressmaking shop. Um, so that they're, they're moving on up. Uh, his little family would uh, move to <laughs> his little family moved to a small place right across the street from the shop, so that his mother could always keep an eye on her shop or work during non-work hours and be really close to home. On August seventeenth, eighteen seventy-two, seven-year-old George Pratt was out playing. Jesse offered him some money to run an errand for him. We all know how this is probably going to go, but question number eight. How much money did Jesse offer the boy? The year is 1872. Greg, can I get a conversion on this before we get there? Are we? Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Are we stabbing? Oh, yeah. Stab only on this one. How much money did he offer the boy? 1872. He's going to run an errand for him. Of course, we, we know where these errands go. Nowhere. Okay. I'm trying to remember how the cents sign is. 25 cents? That's your answer? Joseph says 25 cents. <laughs> Alex kids. says $15. <laughs> Someone has scored 1,000 points. Oh, man. Ooh. I think it's 15 bucks. Congratulations, Joseph. Oh, you are my at 1,500 to 500 now, 1,000 points. Hold on. Can I just say Joseph knew that because he's been playing Red Dead? True. I knew $15 <laughs> is way too much money. <laughs> That's Isaac. <laughs> I feel like I'm, an, I'm a huge asshole now, guys. No. Also, the moment. conversion for that is uh, $4.79 in 2018. There you go. So it was like five bucks. <laughs> hey, do you want a mansion? <laughs> <laughs> I got a bushel of cotton in $11. All right. So, uh, Joseph, nice. Uh, uh, it's been a while since somebody's, I think, stabbed and got one like that. So great job, man. Uh, sorry, Alex. So let's uh, just remember, I, I guessed your birthday. Yeah, that is true. That is true. But there's also plenty of time. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. You're by no means out of this. There are like uh, six more questions. Okay. 
So, <laughs> of course, he offers him the 25 cents, and uh, George Pratt is going to accept it. Jesse lures him to a secluded area, strips and beats him like he has been known to do. But in addition to all of that, during the attack, Jesse bites several chunks of flesh from George Pratt's body and stabs him with a needle. And I don't mean like stabbed him and took it out. Like I think he had a few needles and Albert fished his ass, like pushed a few into him. Um, So and bit a few chunks of flesh. How old is he now? He's uh, he is not turned 13 yet. Oh my God. That's insane. The first attack was December 26th, 1871. It's September, August 17th, 1872. It's been 10 months. Wow. Torture, man. Eight That's months. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah, eight. Wait, less than eight months. So there you go. This is going, it's, it's, this shit's lit right now. Uh, September 5th of 1872. Um, He's going to kidnap six-year-old Harry Austin. He binds and beats him and then takes out a knife and begins to stab the boy in the armpits, uh, being careful not to go too deep. Uh, He didn't want to kill him. He just wanted to torture him. Uh, At this time, he would go down and try to cut the boy's penis, but right before he was able to do so, somebody was walking on a trail nearby, and Jesse just took off. So whoever, that person had no idea that day that they saved a seven-year-old boy from getting his dick chopped off by Jesse Pomeroy. Wow. Yeah. So. So people just hiked back in the 1870s? People hiked. Like, I, I, don't, it, I don't think it, that they're it, hiking. It, like everywhere was nature. So like why hike? Why go out to nature <laughs> to walk around if you're just like everywhere is nature? I think that's just it. It's like he was near where he everyone else was in nature. And everybody's like, I have to walk because everything's nature. And they Uh-oh. walk and he, they just happen to walk by him. That makes more sense. Pictured some dick in like a Jansport backpack and dungarees <laughs> out there walking around. The thing is, is that he he never went far. Most of these attacks are going to occur in broad daylight. These are little kids out running around. They're not, they're not going to be out in the middle of the night. Um, so these are broad daylight attacks close to fairly populated areas for, I mean, we're not talking like California, 1872 wild west. We're talking South Boston. We're talking, you know, one of the first places settled and continued to grow for a hundred years now. So I would imagine South Boston probably had tens of thousands of people in it at that point and probably plenty of children for Jesse Pomeroy to victimize. Um, So, yeah, uh, Harry Austin would also uh, escape with his life because Jesse fled the scene. Uh, September 11th, pre, always remember, 1872, uh, he kidnaps Joseph Kennedy, who is a seven-year-old boy, and took him to a marsh where he bound and beat him and stabbed him with his knife. During this attack, he also made Joseph recite the Lord's Prayer, replacing non-swear words with swear words. But the young seven-year-old decided that he was he would rather die, essentially. He refused to do it. Um, that is creative. Yeah. <laughs> and also incredibly difficult. Yeah. He said, so you know he, how many he, non-swears there are in the Lord's Prayer? Yeah. Like, pretty much the whole thing. Yeah, I was going to say the whole thing. <laughs> I was going to say, I think he's just telling him to, like, put some fucks in there. Come on, see, see, see it. Piece of shit. Yeah. Uh, the seven-year-old boy, I mean, we're talking, like, 1872 seven-year-old. This kid thinks, like, God will come down and strike mm-hmm. him dead if he throws him. some swear words in the Lord's Prayer. So he's like, I'm not going to do it. Uh, again, somebody nearby, I don't know how nearby, but he, Jesse hears somebody and just flees the scene. Six days later, uh, September 17th, 1872, you guys, this is, we're nine months into this fucking spree here. He's going to lure five-year-old Robert Gould and proceeded to strip him and beat him and slash him with his knife. He was attached to a post when found near a railroad yard. So, uh, Jesse slashed him and beat him and at a railroad like you know we're people are working there trains are fucking going by he's got this kid tied to a post and he's slashing him with this fucking knife and he's beating his ass and yeah this is so fucked um this is going to be the first description that is given of jesse pomeroy's white eye and disproportionate size five-year-old so five year old who was wow. slashed with a knife multiple times as well uh, does remember the white eye and the disproportionate size. Uh, 
Do you think they were like, um, like, uh, what do they call surface wounds? Or do you think he was like pretty deep? Like he was like bleeding everywhere. I would, I would, hopefully not the latter because it seems like he was enough. He was well enough to say like, Dark I remember remembered. this fucking weird yeah. eye. And I, so, um, three days later, I'm not sure what was going through Jesse Pomeroy's head. If he was feeling brazen or guilty or what, but on his way home from school, um, he decided that he was going to stop by the police station. Now, let me preface this by saying that when Robert Gould said this kid had a wide eye and that's what I can remember about him. We're not in such a small town that everybody's like, well, it's Jesse Pomeroy. Mm-hmm. Fairly large town. So the police are like out at the schools looking for a kid with this wide eye. And they were at Jesse's school, but they they didn't see him. So that's why I say I'm not sure if he was just like, I can't be caught. I'm walking into this fucking bitch. I'm going to see what's up in there. Or if he was like just feeling extra guilty or what. But he, for whatever reason this day, the day that they were out looking for somebody with a milky white eye, he, he, he walked in. into the police station, his local precinct. And when he did, um, he immediately like stops inside the door. Uh, but Joe Kennedy, one of the assault victims from before, it like jarred his memory. And he was like, that's the guy. So they um, run out and they chase him and he's arrested by police. Uh, that night during questioning, he's going to confess to some of his crimes. Question number nine. How long are they going to attempt to lock him up for this? Oh, how long would they attempt to lock him up for this? He's 12 years old. He's confessed all his, all of his, or most of his crimes that he's done, these tortures of boys. He hasn't killed anyone yet. Yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's caught. 12, 12 years old still. How long are they going to try to lock him up for? Okay. Alex says 12 months. Joseph says five years. On September 21st, 1872, he is arraigned for the attacks on the eight children and was sentenced to be detained at the Massachusetts House of Reformation in Westboro until he turned 18. Joseph, one year off of nailing it, but (laughs) is going to get 250 points. You would have almost nailed back-to-back questions, my dude. Uh, Sorry, Alex. It's okay. Okay, Joseph up 1,750 to 500. We got a prize tonight, by the way. I don't know if we said that. Uh, it's an original painting by me. Don't worry, guys. It's uh, super fucking sweet. They haven't seen it yet, Greg. They decided collectively that they didn't want to see it until it was done. So, uh, um, That's good. You guys are in for a treat. Yeah, you know. Uh, it's, like a, it's like a gore link. It's just a really nice. <laughs> it's just a gore link painted on a piece of paper. <laughs> but not like just like HTTP. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Question number 10. Oh, no. How long would he actually be put away? Alex says he's going to serve four of his six years. Joseph says he's going to serve, how long did you say? Two of them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, he's going to serve 15 months of the sentence. So Joseph's going to score 250 more points. I should have just put 12 months again. (laughs) And go up 2,000 to 500. Um, You can, it's it's not over. It's still not over. Joseph's on a a hot streak for sure. He scored 1,750 points over the last four questions. He can't stay hot that long. You're due. If if you guys listening at home, if you guys believe in me, please blink twice. But if you don't blink once, I need all the help I can get. (laughs) For those of you listening that hate him for saying that, <laughs> just like me, I guess. Don't follow him on Instagram, guys. At JXZXPH. It's like Joseph Pacooler. No, it's so, going to be the Chris thing. Find me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yes, he's arraigned for the attacks of the eight children. Uh, he's sentenced to be detained. There you go. Uh, while, the reform, while in reform school, Jesse was bullied by the older kids there. And the younger kids were afraid of him. So he was in this weird flux where uh, nobody fucking liked him once more. Uh, He seems to be a star inmate while he is here, other than being bullied. I wrote star inmate. It really confused me. (laughs) Uh, Did you call yourself a dumbass? uh, Maybe. Um, So Jesse was never really punished for any of the bad things he did at the reform school because for the most part he kept to himself. So when he did act out, they were like, eh. 
Uh, at the end of the year in 1873, he's finally 13 years old. Holy shit, it feels like he should be 40 by now. Yeah, it does. Uh, he's still at the reform school, and there's like a snake in the grass coming up, and this teacher is freaked out by it. So the teacher asks Jesse to help kill the snake. <laughs> and Jesse gets like this, think like stick with like the knot at the end. It's just like a club, and he clubs the snake. Well, he hits him once, and I think he just got the fucking thirst for blood because the story goes that Jesse, what was the, what was the quote I put in here? Uh, Pomeroy agreed to help and got a little excited at the chance to kill something because he worked himself into a frenzy while beating the snake into an oozing pile. With, it, with his giant erection, right? <laughs> I'm sure. I am absolutely sure. <laughs> February 6th, 1874, he is released from the House of Reformation into the care of his mother after she fought very hard for his parole for the time while he's been in. So he, the entire time he was in, she is fucking fighting for him. Like, this is not my son. He did not do these attacks. You guys coerced the confession. You know, parole him. I, you've already charged him. I know we can't go back. Get him out of there. And she was successful. He's supposed to stay in six years, and um, he stayed in for a much shorter amount of time. Thanks, Mom. March 18th, 1874. That's uh, one month, 12 days after uh, he's out. He's believed to have killed a missing girl, 10-year-old Katie Curran, uh, in his mother's dress store. Uh, this would be his first murder victim, if this is true. At this time, he is only suspected of the crime. There is no proof at all at this point, not even a body. In April of 1874, later, he's going to attempt to lure Harry Field, a five-year-old boy, off to seclusion, but was interrupted by another teenager who recognized the scene as peculiar. Yeah, some kid going, hey, little, little kid, you want some candy, man? This kid's like, hey, the fuck? You know this guy? Uh, good on that teenager. Yeah, that's torture, man. <laughs> good that's, that's, that's torture, man. That's torture, man. Like Michael Jackson. From That's South ignorant. Park. That's ignorant. Ah, uh, no, don't say that. Look at me, I'm Peter Pan. <laughs> I'm a little boy forever. See, so now I'm gonna use that at the beginning of the show. Perfect. But we already have an episode that starts like that, so people <laughs> can be like, wait a second. <laughs> I was just gonna say, haven't we done that though? Um, it's called a callback. Yeah, <laughs> April twenty. They'll be like, it's a little different pitch, though. I think uh, the real fans will know. Yeah, uh, April twenty second, eighteen seventy four. He lures Horace Millen, a four year old boy, off to a secluded place and kills him. Uh, this is going to be, if the Katie Curran murder is true, his second murder victim. Question number eleven. He is going to stab Horace. That's how he's going to die. That's the cause of death. How many times would he stab Horace? Closest to the answer gets 250 points. If you nail it, it's for 1,000. Joseph wants to nail it one more time. Alex needs to. I need to, guys. <laughs> nah, it's okay. Alex says 47. Oh, my God. Joseph says 7. I went with, like, two armpits. Chest, 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 chest. Alex is going to get the points because Jesse is going to stab him 31 times. Oh, my God. Getting back in at Alex. 750 to 2,000. Three questions to go. Thank you, all you guys at home, for blinking twice. <laughs> <laughs> um, April 23rd, 1874, Jesse is suspected of killing Horace Millen and is arrested by police due to some footprints they find in the area of Horace's body. Witnesses also claim to have seen a teenager and a young boy that looked to be alone um, climbing into the marsh together. I guess they had to like climb over a fence. So they saw this teenager helping this f fucking four-year-old get over a fence. Jesse uh, obviously has some history, too. So, you know, the boot prints, the witness, eyewitness. There's some weird big head kid, milky eye, <laughs> son of a bitch, lifting a tiny baby over a fence. And they were like, I think one we know arm, what's going on. One arm on. was much longer than yeah. the other arm. Uh, he really creeps me out. Like, it's, it's not good. Uh, so they go to Jesse's home, and they search him, and they find that he has scratches on his skin, blood on his clothing, as well as boots that match the prints that were left at the scene of Horace Millen's murder. Uh, to boot, <laughs> uh, they had mud on the boots that was matching the very same mud that was in the marsh in question. So he's like, I mean, I don't know what else. 
Yeah. I know everything else sort of speculative, having blood on you, and, and there's no obviously no DNA in 1874, but that's some pretty fine detective work for 1874 when they're like, hey, see the mud on these boots and these prints right here? Like, everything matches up here. That feels like, that's like top-notch work, 1874. It's like Beavis and Butthead when they get their TV stolen. <laughs> they're yeah. just like looking in the direction. <laughs> I love to it be because fair, I know I think exactly that's, what you're talking about. That's fairly good detective work for like now. Yeah, you might be right. You might be right. Um, May 1st, 1874, he is arraigned before Judge Jude Wheelock and pleads not guilty. June of 1874, Pomeroy was taken to view um, Horace Millen's body and asked officially if he committed the murder at the coroner's inquest. Pomeroy was denied the right to counsel. In June of 1870. This is 1874, fucking four, though. Fuck you. You don't get a lawyer. And that's how it's going to be. July 18th of 1874. Question number 13. He's finally going to confess to Katie Curran's murder. Why? Was it A, that he felt guilty that she was the only girl that he killed? B, they were starting to surmount quite a bit of evidence, so he just confessed. C, He's going on a serial confessing spree, or D, he just did it. Alex says they had a lot of evidence. Joseph said he did it. Yeah, he just did it. He I confessed did. to killing Katie Curran after they finally found her body. It was found inside his mother's dress shop. Hey, remember uh, when he just went into the police station? Yeah, he did just he, This guy's got a full he's, he's, he's guilty. So, uh... Twenty-two fifty for Alex, or for uh, sorry, for Joseph. Uh, Seven fifty for Alex. Yeah, he confessed to killing Katie Curran because so his mom using all of her funds to go and uh, try to beat mm-hmm. his defense whenever possible. Obviously, closes the dress shop. Well, a new shop owner comes in and he's like sweeping this pile of debris down in the basement, and he notices some weird fabric, so mm-hmm. he pulls on it. And there's there's bones attached, and it's Gross. the it's the body of Katie Curran that he had kind of like hidden under a stack of rubbish. Dang, poor Katie Couric. Dips on the band name there. What's that? There's bones attached. Ah, uh. <laughs> <laughs> pile of debris. How about that? Yeah, Man. you can nah, have them both. I like that one. Bones attached is better than. That. Uh. So, um, July 22nd, 1874. Uh, after having their daughters back, they can finally have a funeral for Katie Curran. November 6th of 1874, during the hearing of Jesse Pomeroy, doctor said that he is insane. But again, this is before being crazy is a reason to not stand trial. December 9th and December 10th of 1874, the case of Commonwealth versus Pomeroy was heard in the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court in Suffolk County, Boston. At the trial, the attorney general argued for a verdict of guilty of murder in the first degree. In his closing arguments, he urged an alternative charge of murder with extreme atrocity, which, according to Massachusetts law, is first-degree murder, uh, but differs from the original charge in the requirement of premeditation. So essentially, this this adding this with atrocity charge means that he can get something ve- like almost identical to first-degree murder, but he doesn't have to prove that it was premeditated because it was so heinous. Atrocity sounds like that's pretty intense. Yeah. So this is a uh, this is this attorney general is like essentially saying, I don't I don't know if I have the what it takes to yeah. get this first degree, but let's stick him with this shit instead. Um. Yeah. Which they should. Uh, in the close in his closing arguments, he would he urged an alternative charge of murder with extreme atrocity. Uh, Pomeroy was pronounced guilty on December 10th, 1874 with the jury's recommendation of mercy on account of the prisoner's youth. Pomeroy's attorney, Charles Robinson filed two exceptions, which were overruled in February of 1875. What are going to be sorry. Question number 14. What will be his sentence? Is it death? Even though the jury asked for leniency. B, life in prison. C, sent to a hospital for the mentally insane. Or D, 25 to 40 years. Death, life in prison, hospital for the mentally insane, 25 to 40 years. Mm, I'm that having a real hard picture. time here, guys. You're fine. Death, life <laughs> in prison, sent to hospital for mentally insane, or 25 to 40 years. 
Alex says he's sent to the hospital for the mentally insane. Joseph says life in prison. This 13-year-old boy oh, I forgot he's 13. was sentenced to death by hanging. Dang. I didn't think that. I, I thought like 25. Whoa. So it remained for the governor to sign the death warrant and assign the date for Pomeroy's execution. However, oh. Governor William Gaston refused to comply with the executive responsibility. The only legal means of sparing Pomeroy's life was through the Massachusetts Governor's Council. And if a simple majority of a nine-member council voted to commute the death penalty. So he's making it as hard. This this guy doesn't want this kid to die, this governor. I think it's like a political suicide for him yeah. to let a 13-year-old yeah, 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 die on that's his That's so walk. crazy to think about. Like Everything he's done, and he's only 13. Yeah. that's. I thought he was way older, yeah. and that's why like 25 would have seemed but. Yeah, because Katie anyway. Curran's murder was just a few days after, or he got out, right? Mm-hmm. And he was thirteen when he got out, and he was twelve when he committed the other eight attacks. I thought like this was going to be one of those stories where like a bunch of weird shit happens, and then just like for ten years it's gray. But no, it's just like just yeah, he just quick. he just goes all in. So uh, <laughs> over the next year and a half, the council voted three times. The first two votes upheld Pomeroy's execution, but both times Governor Gaston refused to sign the death warrant. In August of 1876, the council took a third vote anonymously, and Pomeroy's sentence was commuted to life in prison in solitary confinement. Hey, that's, that's kind of what I got. Yeah, but that's, that's why I said it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> On the evening of September 7th, 1876, Pomeroy was transferred from the Suffolk County Jail to the state prison at Charlestown and began his life in solitary confinement. Can you guys... Even for him, that's pretty fucking gnarly like life in solitary like it's it, i mean he i'm not saying that he doesn't deserve it but that's just make that you're just killing somebody i think i feel pretty like. much yeah. stick every day of your life for the rest of your life in solitary it's yeah i Wait, think we, i think even then it was like 23 hours a day in your cell by yourself yeah that's that's a lot man um so he he is Charles Damien, he was 16 years and nine months old after it's all said and done. All the votes, all the death sentence, he's not even 17 yet. And uh, he's going to be serving his life sentence uh, in solitary confinement. Damn. Rest of his life. Pomeroy remained incarcerated in the Charlestown State Prison. Uh, in prison, Pomeroy claimed that he taught himself to read several foreign languages, including Hebrew. And one visiting psychiatrist found that he learned German with quote, considerable accuracy. Uh, he wrote poetry and argued with prison officials over his right to have it published, and he studied law books and spent decades composing legal challenges to his conviction and requests for a pardon. A psychiatric report on Pomeroy made in 1914 and quoted extensively in the Boston Globe after his death noted that Pomeroy had made 10 or 12, quote, determined attempts to escape, and that handmade tools were frequently found in his possession. A prison warden reported finding rope, steel pins, and a drill that Pomeroy had concealed in his cell or on his person. According to the Globe, Pomeroy lost one eye or lost his eye after attempting to destroy the side of his cell, reacting to a gas pipe. He lost his milky eye. I was gonna say, I hope it was his other eye. Uh, in 1914, the psychiatric report, oh, sorry, the 1914 psychiatric report claimed that Pomeroy had shown the greatest ingenuity in a, sorry, the greatest ingenuity and a persistence, which is unprecedented in the history of the prison. So they're saying like, this guy really kind of turned his shit around while he was in here. In 1915, Jesse's mother, Ruth Ann will die. The one person that ever visited him or believed in him is now gone. In 1917, Pomeroy's sentence was commuted to the extent of allowing him the privileges afforded to other uh, life prisoners. So now he's like, he's in gin pop for people who are life sentencers. So uh, 1917, what, so how long did he spend? Yeah, so from 1876 to 1917, he was in that cell. Solitary. So for 40 years-ish, he was just chilling up in uh, solitary. Crazy. Yeah. Uh, so he first, uh, resisted even going into general population, uh, wanting nothing less than a pardon. He was just like, no, that's not enough. I, I think I've done my time. I spent 40 years Mm -hmm. in solitary confinement. You guys can fucking let me go now. Uh, they were like, nah, nah, take gin pop. Trust me. That's all you're going to get. 
he eventually did it and adjusted to his uh, life and changed his circumstances and appeared even in a minstrel show at the prison. A uh, minstrel show is like a, pretty much a, a racist uh, show. It's think of those like it, it's think like SNL where all the white people are in blackface. I was and gonna say it was for sure blackface. Yeah, it was, it was. It was, it was like very popular for the time. <coughs> is it like they put on a show for the other prisoners? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But um, you know, I don't give a shit what year it is. This is just one more reason to fucking hate Jesse Pomeroy. Mm-hmm. In 1929, uh, he is by this time an elderly man in frail health. He was transferred to Bridgewater Hospital for the Criminally Insane. Last question. And Joseph, I didn't forget about you. Trust I still have another story. You're, you're coming up. I swear. Oh, it's okay. I'm cool. Doodling. Question number 15. Um, I think, Alex, you can't win. Uh, <laughs> Blink harder. <laughs> but let's do it anyway. In what year did Jesse Pomeroy die? E still alive. <laughs> mm, I'm changing this, guys. Thank you. So, um, I just don't want to guess like before he was even in the hospital. Wait, what? Because I don't remember. Okay, can I just get the dates? One? No, no, I don't need the dates. I'll yeah, need... yeah. Alex already wrote his, so he, you I'm got just, it. I'm just going with that guy. Joseph yeah. says 1928. Alex changed his 1932 to 1941. Jesse Pomeroy died September 29th, 1932. Dang, guys. So uh, Joseph's going to get the points because Alex changed his answer. Uh, He would have nailed it, but he went against his gut again. I told you, man. Go with your gut. Go with your gut. So uh, Joseph's got 250 points to make it uh, 2,500 to 750. Congratulations, JXEXPH. You are today's winner. Uh, let me show you your prize. Then we're going to go to break. We're going to come back with Joseph's story. And then I actually have a side story because I, it was fucked and I needed to bring it to the show. So uh, let me show you your prize here. Hey, everyone. There's a lot of times where we will save some clips from the show and we never really know what to do with them. So uh, here's one of those clips. Let's call it a greatest moments instead of a commercial. Huh? Want to throw anything out there before we jump yeah, off? Any social yeah, media? No, any actually, I, yes, I please really do. would yeah. like to um, throw a shout out to the um, Central Indiana <laughs> Multi Agency <laughs> Task Force. Central <laughs> Indiana for basically, Multi Agency Investigative team. Basically doing fucking team. nothing <laughs> when fucking 22.5 people died. <laughs> <laughs> you guys could do your goddamn job to figure out That's one, one goddamn murder. Was about you let this guy play you that. for a forty-three dollars citation over the course of fucking months. Hey. Like, get fucked. but did they collect? <laughs> but did they collect a paycheck? Oh, they got paid. And did you die, bro? No. <laughs> then, then everybody wins here. And thank you for listening to episode thirty-three of the Serial Chillers podcast. Sorry. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. So uh, we've done things a little differently here, obviously, tonight. The game show part is over. It was very fun. Congratulations again to Joseph on his victory. Uh, There'll be be another day, Alex. Good good job. There'll be another day. Uh, We've got (laughs) Joseph's story uh, here. He brought one. Then I have a side story for you guys as well. Um, Yeah, take it away, Joseph. Okay. So my story is actually, it's pretty short, and it's not so much of creepy. It's just like an unfortunate story. Okay. It's about Nutty Putty Cave, if you guys have heard of it. I <laughs> have. Yeah. All right. So. I hate this. <laughs> it's, it makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. Like to, That's what I mean by like, it's just an uncomfortable. Sure. All right. So on November 23rd, 2009, a 26-year-old man named John Jones set out to explore Nutty Putty Cave. John Jones was a 6'1", 200-pound cave exploring regular. So, like, from when he was a young, from when he was a young lad, he would like go like cave hunting or spelunking. Cave, I believe it's called spelunking. 
Is it called? I like I like cave hunting. Cave hunting. Cave hunting. You know, he'd hunt <laughs> he's for a caves. cave hunter. Well, spelunking is the, like is, spelunking, the, uh, yeah. is the term. that's the preferred nomenclature. But yes, yeah, but cave hunting. No. <laughs> nah, that sounds like an adventure. <laughs> yes, it is. Helson of caves. Anyways, so John lived in Utah. So and he was a regular cave dude. So of course he's gonna <laughs> explore Nutty Putty Cave because it's located in Utah. If you don't know, and it's a hydrothermal cave. Which I tried to do research, but it wasn't. I'd even put in on my search bar hydrothermal cave for dummies so I could explain it, but it just had too many words. So uh, was, it's a cave system hoping. that like it may feed to a, it has hot water. Yeah, see, that's what I thought, but then I got confused because it's not how Safari told me. It. Because but, I, do, I also don't believe that it contains hot water anymore. It was carved by hot water. Okay, yeah, that. If I'm not mistaken. That's why I didn't write it because that still doesn't really make sense to me. But so John went. Through this cave, and I assumed by that, by them describing the cave, like just had like a lot of weird turns and weird like drops and stuff yeah. like that. So he was going further and deeper into the cave, and he actually got stuck. And it wasn't just a regular stuck; he got stuck upside down in like it was basically like a big V. Yeah. And he got stuck in the middle, and so he was upside down, just stuck facing down. And then it was just that just makes me so uncomfortable. Have you seen the infographic on like the whole the whole thing? I Have you ever seen that, Greg? Yeah, it's it. it's brutal. So he's basically upside down in a V, and he's stuck, and there's nine people that are just, like, standing above this hole looking down at him, and he can't see them, so they're just, like, talking to him, and then they're trying to come up with a plan. And so what they start doing is they start drilling into it, but every movement they're making on the top, it's causing, like, him to slowly go smaller in. And then they're like, well, we'll just do a pulley system, pull him up. And as they're trying to do this, the same problem, every tug up, it was like two tugs down. And so he was just getting more squeezed. And so what they decided to do is the best thing for him is this one dude, Ryan Shirts, Shirts, he was talking to him, like attempting to keep him calm. Mm -hmm. and, was, so, and I think his brother was there too, right? His dad was there. Dad, okay. So what um, Ryan did was he actually went into the cave and was talking with him. And then that made John a lot better because like it was the first person he saw. Yeah. He was, he was in there for like 12 hours at the time. And so what they did was they hooked up an IV, an injection feed into his leg. Ooh. And they were putting drugs into him to like relax him out because he's like totally upside down. And it's just like yeah. claustrophobic. And I think there was also like, like there was like. Is that the one you were popping up? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was, there's like blood pooling in his lungs and his, yeah. obviously his brain because he's little, like almost he's directly upside, upside down, down. For at this point, 14 hours. And then everyone's Fuck. just yelling at him. And then so as Ryan was talking to him, John just starts talking about how he it sucks that he's upside down and he's complaining that he's stuck upside down. And uh, so while he's upside down, he just talk about how his wife and he has a one year old and his new baby on the way. Shit. And then so his wife actually, because he's from Utah, his wife comes down and is uh, he started talking to her about like, I'll get out and I'll tell Lizzie I love her and I'm not going caving again. And then so. John or Ryan is just talking to him down, just trying to relax him while he's tripping on drugs. And then it was a solid 26 hours when Ryan's dad, I don't remember his name, told him he was like, yeah, we're not going to be able to get him out. And then Ryan yeah. just is like that. This part is when it gets sucks because they just like kind of get silent because Ryan was the dude talking to him uh -huh. and Ryan was the familiar. And then he just like starts relaxing. He's like, man, it doesn't look like it's going to get out. And then so 28 hours being stuck, he passed away from suffocation. And yeah. The pulley system they rigged up, like, ran all the way through the cave like crazy. But <clears throat> when they pulled him up, his legs were hitting the yeah. roof. So the only way that they could even possibly do it were to, like, horribly, cripplingly break mm -hmm. both of his legs. Yeah. And before they even got to that, they, yeah, so... Yeah, pretty it, sad was, story, man. Was, I yeah, I was for sure familiar with it, but still, yeah. And then um, interesting as hell. So the so what the family. I, I got a oh. question though before you before you continue. Oh no, go ahead. So there was a guy who went down on the bottom side. He wasn't at the bottom. He was like <clears throat> kind of to the side of the cave. Because if you look at it, there's like it's like kind of an L, but more of an angle. He's like to okay. the side to where John can kind of look to the side and see him, but uh -huh. he wasn't like down lower than he was. 
Because then they could, if he was like that, then they would have had. Different... It wasn't a spot that he was going to be able to get to. Yeah, it, they well, were. I just... mean, I was just saying, like they couldn't go down to where yeah. he was coming through and like break the rocks. Okay, I think okay. I believe the spot that he got caught in is called the birth canal. Mm-hmm. Ha. Yeah. <laughs> so ironical. Yeah, but Con- continue. <laughs> so the family and the landowner agreed to seal up the cave with John still resting inside. And the way that they did that is because they want to prevent more deaths. Mm -hmm. And a cool little thing that the wife said was this little quote I'm going to read. John loves the outdoors. He loves Utah. He loves wide open space. It's so fitting that this is his spot now. And that's what they have on a little sign. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, shit. Yes, they do. Dang. Wow. Yeah, it's so sad and so uncomfortable because I would not want to be tripping on drugs if I'm upside down and make my claustrophobia. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I shoot me in the thigh. And you know what's crazy is like I've gone caving. Mm -hmm. I mean, nothing near that. And I would never do that ever in a fucking hundred years. I just do cool little 150 feet under a big rock kind of rounds. But this, yeah. I mean, people who do it, do your thing, man. But please be careful and please, please know what you're doing. Did he, did he get stuck or did he fall? He, he, he was, was he was trying to go down. He was he discovered. Was, he was trying to go deeper. Yeah, that's what you do. Yeah, you, he you was just kind of just crawl in. into a hole, man. Figure it out. Um, good story, dude. Yeah, that was thank you. Was, so uh, my uh, my little side story. I actually instead of doing it as a side story, I just brought the article. I'd like to read it. So um, this article comes from the Washington Post. It was written by Kyle Swenson uh, just a few days ago, January seventh, two thousand nineteen. Um, here we go. When police officers sped into the small coin laundromat located on a quiet intersection in Wausau, Wisconsin, the mother's worst nightmare was already unfolding inside. According to a criminal complaint letter filed in state court, the official arrived as, sorry, the officer arrived as the unidentified woman frantically worked at the small child's chest. Uh, This was a two month old baby boy lying on a table. The child was motionless, his skin cold, his mouth clenched shut. The baby's legs were rigidly bent at the knees, frozen into the position they had been in the car seat just before the mother realized her son was no longer drawing air. As the mother would later tell investigators, only minutes before coming to the laundromat last October, she had picked up the child from a babysitter named Marissa Tietzort. A 28-year-old mother of five, then pregnant with her sixth child, Tietzort had handed the baby over to the mother, Uh, already snapped into the car seat, seemingly quiet asleep. But now we know the child was dead. You killed my sister's baby was a quote that the mother's sister texted Tetsort within minutes of police arriving at the laundromat. Hours later, police reached Tetsort, who admitted she knew the child had died in her care, but she did not know how or why. Instead of calling for help, Tetsort said she bundled the boy up in his winter clothing, pulled a hat over his eyes, and snapped him into his car seat. She later returned the boy over to her mother uh, without telling the child was already dead. So she handed her a fucking car seat with her dead kid. And they're like, oh, dang. Yeah. It was like family guy when Stewie fell. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> no very weekend at Bernie's. Uh, but a lot, a lot less funny. That's that's insane. Like, that's super and she, sad. And she, would, would you think she wasn't going to find out? You think she's just going to be like, boy, this kid sleeps a lot. <laughs> I, I, I don't think this woman was thinking at all. I, I think, think just she, a panic she mode, probably you know? thought that, like, oh, if I give it back to, like, the, you know, death she's won't be on my She's also kind of got a meth face. Uh, like when you, <clears throat> when you broke something at your friends, so you put it back together just enough for them to use it once and break it, and you could be like, oh, yeah. that sucks. What would you do, dude? You got to be more careful, man. <laughs> that was the Family Guy <laughs> reference. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so yeah, she passed the mother off. The baby is dead. The coroner's report uh, would paint a much uglier and more violent picture than what Tetzort would say that she. I don't know what happened. Last Friday, Tetzort was charged with first degree intentional homicide. The Wausau Daily Herald reported. As Tietzort made her first appearance in the courtroom last week, friends and family members of the deceased boy filled the courtroom wearing shirts featuring his picture. Uh, the child's alleged murder, however, was made all the more shocking when the state revealed that it is not the first time Tietzort had been accused of hurting children in her care. 
Tietzort has been in police custody since October, and although she has yet to enter a plea in the murder case, she did defend herself in a recent letter sent to the judge in her case. I am not a threat to society or a monster, she wrote. According to the Daily Herald, I am a great mom and I love everybody. According to a criminal complaint, between 3.30 and 4 p.m. on October 18th, 2018, the mother dropped off her two-month-old and a young and a young child uh, at Tietzort's home. So this mother um, found a babysitter and dropped off. I think she had a four-year-old and a two-month-old. Uh, she was the only adult at the house at the time. Around 6 p.m., the mother received a strange text message from Tietzort, the babysitter, uh, who said a local news site had posted a story about child abuse charges that had been filed against her. She was not supposed to be alone around children, Tietzort told the mother, so the babysitter asked uh, the mother not to tell anyone she was watching her kids. How fucking concerning would this Dude, be? Dude, that's and, not And from what I understand, cool. this woman was not like just out hey, like getting a drink with friends. She was at work, and that's the situation of life for her. Following the baby's death, when investigators interviewed Tietzort, she claimed that the two-month-old had died before her boyfriend returned home around 6.30 p.m. The criminal complaint does not state whether she offered any explanation for how the child died. Quote, she stated that the victim felt cold and she knew he was dead. End quote. The criminal complaint stated uh, she also said that she did not check for a pulse, she did not reach out for any help, and she did not perform any resuscitation efforts. Tietzort um, admitted that she put the victim's lifeless body on the floor in the hallway of her home, grabbed his snowsuit from the car, uh, dressed him in the snowsuit, and then placed his body in the car seat with his blankets. When Tietzort's boyfriend returned around 6.30 p.m., she did not tell him about the death either. Instead, she loaded up the deceased baby in the car and the baby's uh, four-year-old brother and her own child into the car. Tietzort and her boyfriend drove to McDonald's, where they ate dinner. Uh, then the baby's mother returned to pick up the child about 9.20 p.m. Tietzort again allegedly stayed silent, allowing the mother to assume the baby was simply asleep. Once the mother arrived at the local laundromat, she realized the child was not breathing. When a forensic pathologist performed an autopsy on the child, the evidence countered Tietzort's account. The baby had at least three separate blunt force injuries to his head, according to the criminal complaint. The child's tailbone had also been broken off, indicating a significant amount of force was used. The rigor mortis that had set in the baby's legs, bent the knees from sitting in the car seat, indicated the child had been murdered at least two hours before police were called to the laundry, the complaint stated. Tietzort's past run-ins with the police and child service agencies allegedly point to a pattern of abuse. Weeks before the two-month-old death, she was babysitting an 11-month-old. Tietzort told the child's mother the baby had fallen off the couch and injured her face. Doctors, however, said that the injuries could not have happened from a fall such as Tietzort described. Felony charges were filed against Cesar in October, and the same charges she alerted the two-month-old mother about the night of the baby's death. What's that? Mega lame. That's that's poor excuse for a a person. A year earlier, a three-month-old child that Tietzort was babysitting was also injured in her care, suffering a skull fracture. According to the Daily Herald, she was not charged in the case. In 2010, her then-boyfriend filed a temporary restraining order against her for allegedly abusing their two sons. The newspaper reported social workers removed Tietzort's four children from her home, but state workers did not know she had a fifth child or that she was now pregnant with a sixth baby. She is now being held on a $500,000 bond, and she is due back in court on January 18th. This will be uh, coming out after that, so we'll, we'll update that as soon as it comes out. Or maybe we'll even add it on to this before that. But, yeah, I don't know. Something just grabbed me with that story. It was just so incredibly dark that yeah. I had to bring it. So, um, yeah, man. Uh, thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it shows, I didn't really think this out, I suppose. <laughs> that story um, made me feel really bad about yeah, myself, guys. I'm sorry. Well, here, you want me to pile on? Uh, Did you see the article about uh, the guy that confessed to Jean Benet Ramsey's killing? What? What? Is he, yeah. is he a bullshit artist? Um, uh, apparently, he's a convicted uh, pedophile. Huh? Can you fill us in, in, Greg? What's that? Can you can you fill us in a little bit on the story? Yeah, he said he did it. He said he <laughs> fucking Go- Google Google that Google shit. Yard. Well, okay. So here, hold on. Give me a sec. I'll pull up the article. I don't buy it though. Yeah, I don't either. I'll uh, 
Send it over. We'll, we'll look at it after. I'll finish up the show here. Okay. Never. So, yeah. Fucked story. Joseph, also fucked story, but uh, fucked in a different fuck way. Uh, Jesse Pomeroy, a real asshole. Yep, yep. Uh, Joseph, congratulations on your dominating victory. Thank you. Uh, Greg. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, what? Uh, where can they find you? Tell them some stuff about stuff at the end and stuff. Um. At Hella Greg anywhere, just 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 Google it or something or don't whatever. You're on the Googles. <laughs> You're on the. I'm Googles. easy. I'm easy to find. He's pretty easy to find, uh, uh, except for in find. person. It's a regular bunker. You won't find him anywhere. Um, thank you, Greg. Appreciate you. Greg did some producer shit hardcore tonight, and I uh, thank you very much. <laughs> I changed uh, the number of a question. Hey, you reminded did. you where you were. Okay, look, I was just trying to give you credit for some shit, and you're now you're out here making <laughs> making us both look dumb. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, yeah, really fun, dudes. Thank you guys for hanging out. Um, really appreciate everybody for listening. Check out the Patreon to give. Rate us on everything. Uh, thank you guys for listening to episode seventy seven. Remember, don't talk to strangers. Bye, guys. Just listen to another podcast by Super Network.